The Debrief is a production of faculty at the National Security Affairs Department at the U.S. Naval War College. The views presented here are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions of the Department of Defense or any of its components. Welcome to The Debrief, where we deconstruct defense, diplomacy, and development in national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. I'm your co-host, Theo Milanopoulos. The interagency process coordinates the development and implementation of national security policy across executive branch departments at all levels of the federal government. How does the Defense Department translate policy guidance into operational level of planning? And how do national security professionals and regional theaters coordinate with their interagency counterparts to implement these policies? Here to help us answer these questions is Captain Jeff Benson of the U.S. Navy, who has commanded a destroyer for deployed in the Sea of Japan and recently concluded a tour as the Division Chief for China and Taiwan in the J-5 Strategy, Plans, and Policy Director of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Jeff, thanks for joining us here on The Debrief. Hey, thanks so much. So I was wondering if you could start off by telling us what the interagency process is and how the J-5, the Strategy, Plans, and Policy Directorate, fits into that process. Sure, Theo. I think, you know, the two ways to describe it is there is a formal process and an informal process. Um, let's start with the informal process. Uh, as you know, we have several departments and agencies throughout our federal government. And really the informal process is building those relationships um, at the professional level on issues of concern um, that are, are cross-related. Um, and so you build those relationships and you work those issues, um, not with any necessarily formal process, but with the network within the, the DC or across the country. Um, the second aspect is the uh, formal, um, which as we know is uh, coordinated by the National Security Council. Uh, you start out with the Interagency uh, Policy Committee, the IPC, uh, which they uh, host and, and coordinate. Um, and at that level is really uh, a lot of the staff work is done um, looking at two different areas, either one, issues for discussion um, that may pertain to a certain uh, regional area or a functional aspect of, uh, of government. And then you have um, the aspect of the deputies committee. So you go from an interagency policy committee to a um, deputies committee. And at the deputies committee, that's you know uh, typically uh, your your deputies within those cabinet levels, and then moving on up to the principals uh, of, the, of the National Security Council. Um, not to go back a little bit, you know, so you have those issues for discussion, and then you have issues for decision. Those are the typically the the two things that happen within the interagency at the the National Security Council level. Uh, doesn't say that there can't be other issues or other ways to do it. Um, each administration has a little bit different way of doing uh, those interagency meetings, but that really is the the driving mechanism um, for us in our government to address issues of concern, uh, address things um, that we want to achieve. Uh, it's also a place to look at strategy um, beyond policy and look at uh, options and recommendations for the president to take action on or for our government to, to move forward on. So when it, we're thinking about the interagency process, we're really bringing all of these different departments and agencies onto the same page, right, in terms of defense, State Department, uh, uh, some of the other equities, uh, the UN mission to, uh, or the U.S. mission to the United Nations. Um, what kinds of, you mentioned strategy as one component that gets mm -hmm. developed through this. Um, what, how does the national security strategy, when it's developed by each administration, move through this interagency process? And what is the role of the J-5 in helping develop those strategies? Yeah, so within a national security strategy, each administration uh, comes in. Uh, typically what happens is that the, uh, from a defense perspective, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, as well as the Joint Staff, sends representatives to work with the National Security Council and a team of strategists. It's more from a functionalist standpoint because it is a worldwide strategy for the national security of our country. Um, from there, those individuals then reach back um, to folks uh, that are more of the regional experts to help provide input into that. But really when that national security strategy is developed, it's really developed you know, from a functional standpoint. It doesn't mean that you don't have regional experts or, or, or those contributing to it, but it's written by people who, who, who write strategy for, for a living or that's their profession. Um, once that national strategy is, is, is written, um, it then obviously goes to the, you know, a national defense strategy is developed by the, the Office of Secretary of Defense and then, you know, the joint staff of the national military strategy. Um, those are all interagency in the sense of um, 
little bit smaller in, in cohort with the national defense strategy and national military strategy, but done really kind of outside of the, you know, the typical interagency uh, policy committee. So it's, it's, it's more of a different uh, avenue than, than you would have a policy issue, but it's still kind of the same concept where you're bringing folks together, uh, you know, hashing out words and language and what direction, you know, the United States government wants to go uh, in, in any particular uh, area. And do, the interagency process is not just taking place within the executive branch uh, either. Um, I understand that you've had some experience throughout your career in Capitol Hill. I was wondering if you could help students understand the role of Congress in helping shape the parameters that, that end up uh, shaping the interagency process, yeah, and maybe what some things students might be surprised to learn about the role of Congress in developing uh, national security policy and strategy. Yeah, Theo, it's a great point. I mean, you know, everything I just now talked about was about the executive branch and how they work with the, the, the federal cabinet uh, level officials and, and the agencies, um, but Congress gets a vote, right? And, and, and they do have um, their own processes in you know, reviewing things and uh, evaluating and offering their opinions on. Um, I think it's real important if you are developing a strategy or a policy that um, you do talk to Congress. You know, people can maybe shy away from that, but I think it's real important that you know you use the right avenues within your um, you know legislative uh, cohorts within your organization to to reach out. Um, you know, there's certain protocols you need to, to to do as a military officer, but to do those things and working with the civilian uh, folks at um, OSD um, to make sure that you're, they're part of the process and you understand where they're coming from. Um, because what I have found in, in my experience is that once you do that, and I've seen, you know, senior level officials do it, and they do it well in informing Congress, you get a better product, and you get a better uh, strategy for the United States. You know, um, not communicating, you know, now people question what are you trying to do, and, and I think having that um, ability to communicate often and regularly and in informing Congress and getting the buy-in from them doesn't mean that there's not going to be you know, there are going to be disagreements, right? And that's good. I mean, that we're a democracy, and, and I think that's important. Um, but it, it's real important that they, you reach out to, to the, and get the congressional perspective. Sometimes often overlooked or the last thing you look at, it probably should be incorporated as you develop that strategy or policy. And some of the other inputs that are coming from the wider ecosystem in the D.C. Beltway uh, are some of the uh, non-governmental organizations like think tanks and other kinds of research organizations that are feeding into these processes. What role or influence do the products from those entities have in shaping uh, uh, some of these policies? Yeah, so the think tanks in, in general for the military, I think, are often overlooked in, in, that, in that process. doesn't mean that um, the military doesn't work with things we do, and I think some services are better at it than, 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 than others, but uh, they play an important role. I mean, if you just take a case in point with, uh, you know, in an administration, you know, a vice president from a think tank organization now becomes, you know, the uh, deputy secretary of defense or the assistant secretary for Indo-Pacific uh, affairs. Um, they have experience in that area, now coming in government, maybe we'll go back to that think tank. So there, there is that revolving door which I believe is actually good for, for our government because you have that experience and knowledge being leveraged at the highest levels. Um, so for the military, you know, doing that, it, it's also a great resource, um, you know, to get kind of what the outside world or the unclassified information is, is out there and what the f pulse of, of, of a particular issue, strategy, or policy different from your organization, which I think for any organization is always helpful to get that perspective. So leveraging think tanks, leveraging uh, other organizations as you develop a strategy or a policy can only, uh, you know, benefit from that. And of course, the interagency process is not just a creature of Washington, D.C. either. Um, it's, it's happening really uh, at Combatant Command headquarters uh, across the country and even around the globe at U.S. embassies. I was wondering if you could help students understand, uh, and viewers and listeners, uh, what uh, kinds of interagency processes and dialogues are taking place closer to the ground. So interagency you know we, we you know we talked at the very beginning broadly how it works within the federal government but with within the DOD there's also kind of an inter, interagency within an interagency um, so for example the joint staff is J5 um, we obviously work closely with the intelligence J2 and the J3 for operations within that staff but then as J5 you know when we look at let's say China um, that's a global problem set 
So we are working not only with Indo-Pacific Command, but we're also working with the other combatant commanders throughout the world, given China's global reach. So now the Joint Staff is not only focused on working with the Indo-Pacific Combatant Command, they're also working with the other combatant commands um, to do that. The other thing, too, is that the Joint Staff, in addition to working with the combatant commands, is also representing the service chiefs. And so, you know, just focusing and, and servicing and being an advocate for those combatant commands is only half of it. You also have to find out what the services are, are needing and wanting and what their perspectives are and bringing both of those together to help formulate strategy policy or implement strategy and policy. You know, we talk about the national security strategy and the other, you know, national defense strategy, national military strategy. Once those are done, um, one of the major roles of the, the J-5 organization, based on the region or, or country or, or whatever, campaign plans are developed. Those campaign plans are developed in concert with the combatant commanders um, to basically you know, get the effect of what the strategy wants to achieve. And, and so those, are, those items are, are, are lined up, put together, and um, then the combatant commands uh, sign off with the, with the chairman and the vice chairman uh, concurring with it. And it now moves down to combatant commands who now parse those, you know, those objectives out um, and goals out to um, you know, their theaters. Now, at the J-5, you served as division chief for China and Taiwan. I was wondering if you could help us understand what a division chief does and if there are any kind of specific examples that you might be able to walk us through uh, from the past about how uh, the interagency process helped facilitate uh, planning and strategy uh, in the region, particularly with regard to U.S. policy towards Taiwan. Yeah, so going back to the you know, initial comments, when we talk about functional and regional, as a division chief for strategy plans and policy um, for a specific country, as I was for China and Taiwan, um, that's my sole, fo sole focus. Um, so uh, the things that J5 will typically do that maybe is not, um, not well broadcasted is that uh, the chairman um, also is an advocate for all those combatant commanders. So when a commander, com combatant commander is nominated and goes through the congressional process, the J-5 provides briefings on policies and strategies for that specific area um, before that nomination process, um, which I think is, is real important and, and, and good to know. Uh, the other thing, is, and we've talked about, you know, inputting to when strategies to be developed, the campaign plans. The other thing that the J-5 does is part of the war plan. So, uh, you know, this is where policy meets war plans, the strategy. It's all kind of the nexus of everything. So if you're on the left, you had, you know, the intelligence, and on the right, you had the operations. We're kind of the glue that kind of makes it all work uh, going together. Um, one of the most important things as a division chief, too, is that interagency process, especially on joint staff, because the chairman is the principal advisor to the president. So you're advising the chairman. So when he goes in or she goes into the, those meetings with the president, the secretary of defense and other principal um, principals in the, in the uh, committee meetings, um, they have the most relevant and most important information and accurate information to have those discussions to eventually hopefully you know get to a decision point. Um, so we're, we're providing that. We also support the vice chairman uh, in addition to the chairman um, and uh, in, in not only the interagency process but also representing the services and the combatant commands. So it's a pretty, um, the depth and breadth of it is pretty wide. I probably missed a few <laughs> in, in, in that. Um, probably the only thing I, I would probably uh, add is that key leader engagements with that specific country, um, whether it's you know Korea, Japan, or if you know uh, um, you know the, the Five Eyes. Um, each one of those J five division chiefs is in charge of those key leader engagements with the chairman with that with that uh, you know cognizant country. So it almost sounds like the you know the division chief has at the J five has the nexus between the interagency process and an intra agency process across right. the services across the the combatant commands. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, your your uh, area of focus and regional expertise is is in uh, the South China Sea. Um, what kinds of developments uh, have taken place over the last ten years in terms of uh, uh, near peer competitors who are uh, 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 making moves in the South China Sea. Uh, what do you see as the source of those uh, changes, and how is the United States adjusting to uh, address them? Yeah, the South China Sea is an enormous issue that um, we could probably do a whole podcast right. specifically exactly. on the on the South China Sea. But maybe just uh, highlight some of the things that have 
have happened, um, you know, in the past and here recently and going forward. Um, you know, uh, the PLA established, uh, it's, everyone knows that they established, you know, man-made islands in the South China Sea, um, which has definitely changed the political dynamic within the Southeast Asia countries. Um, I think we saw a point uh, in time here, you know, with, with the Philippines kind of, you know, not as uh, cooperative with the United States, but that has since changed. And I think the, you know, the Biden administration has done a great job in you know, making that um, relationship with the Philippines better. Um, and going forward, that's gonna be a, a real important uh, point, especially as we look as the Chinese have developed Mischief Reef uh, near Second Thomas Shoal. And what we've seen is an increase um, in you know, those relief efforts going into Second Thomas Shoal. So with that, um, you know, we have definitely seen um, an increase in the activity there. And when it comes to thinking about how the United States might strategically or adjust course to address this challenge, what kinds of things should students be thinking about when they're trying to diagnose uh, or think through uh, some new challenges and new opportunities for for uh, maintaining U.S. presence in the region. I think the you know the, the first and probably most important thing is look his historically what's happened, right? I mean, um, you know, you, you have to really you know dig into to the historical facts and then all the nuances that are in place in such a very regional and very um, dynamic uh, you know area. Um, that is constantly changing. I mean, we could go through the list of South China Sea issues, mm -hmm. even from the legal aspects, um, you know, going through there. I think, you know, looking back historically, looking at what the current is, and then thinking about, you know, okay, where, you know, where are we going into the future and crafting a you know, strategy of policy that can kind of fit um, and meld all of those different aspects of it is probably the, the way to go. Um, and then make some assumptions of things that, you know, we, that may happen um, just as a thought process. You know, I mean, if, if something happens in the South China Sea, what does that mean? Um, and, and how would we react? And, and think about those things from an analytic as well as a um, um, historical perspective, I think is really, really important. Now, you were, in addition to your distinguished career, uh, also a student here at the Naval War College. Um, were there certain experiences that you found to be especially valuable, perhaps that you didn't even appreciate at the time, but then realized when you got to the Pentagon that those things really crystallized, or uh, uh, advice to students about how to spend the remainder of their time here? I mean, anytime you're at a, a, an academic institution, you know, you should have fun. And I think uh, we lose sight of that, you know, writing papers and, you know, doing all that. And I think, you know, you're really in a great environment. Um, and I think just kind of, you know, take a deep breath, sit back and kind of enjoy that part of it. Now, with that said, um, one of the things uh, as being a student here, and I think what Naval War College has done a great job, is the depth and breadth that you get. Um, you know, we talk about think tanks and, uh, you know, Congress and OSD. I mean, you get to go through all that. And at the time as a student, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you, we're, we're, you know, we're not deep in doing a deep dive, but we're getting little snippets of every little piece. And I think that is so important because, you know, you don't know what job you're going to be in, you know, five, seven, ten years from when you graduate from the Naval War College. And so to be able to reach back um, to that, I, I think is real important. The last thing I'll say is that Probably the most important thing you know people emphasize at the Naval War College is the relationships, your peer relationships. I agree with that, but I think it goes one step further. I think the relationships you make with your professors and practitioners here is really what sets you up for success. Uh, when I was division chief, I was able to reach back um, to some of those professors who I established a relationship with, um, and they were able to provide you know great great insights and things that I was not seeing from the Beltway perspective. And I think that's real important. So in addition of you know, creating those strong peer relationships, creating that strong relationship with your professors and the, the teachers and, and, and people here um, will pay dividends uh, in the future. Well, as a faculty member, I certainly appreciate <laughs> it, hearing from students when uh, uh, they've moved on, even uh, years hence, uh, about you know that one needling point that I kept on hammering home is finally uh, that seed is, has blossomed into uh, something that is important for them to know in their career. So uh, appreciate that insight. Appreciate you coming here on the debrief, uh, and uh, hope that uh, uh, we'll have other uh, uh, graduates. Uh, shaping our, our national security uh, uh, environment. 
Uh, thank you so much. Great to be here. All right. Thanks, thanks. Kat Benson. Thanks.